Hey Unraiders and welcome to another video. Now this one's designed for new users. If you just set up your Unraid server, you're probably seeing the word Docker absolutely everywhere. Now it's the magic that runs applications like MB, Plex, Bitwarden, Qubit Torrent and so many more. But if you're anything like I was when I first started, you might be staring at settings for networking, path mappings and other strange terms and just feeling a little bit lost. So the purpose of this series is to demystify Docker and give you a solid understanding of how it works. So that way you'll have both the knowledge and the confidence to deploy containers properly, not just get them running, but to run them efficiently and using the best practices. So I'm going to be splitting this into short bite-sized parts so it's easier to follow along and easier to come back to in the future and find the bit you need. So this first video, I'm going to be focusing on one thing, what a Docker container actually is. I'll explain how it differs from installing a program directly onto a computer, or in Unraid's case, installing a plugin into the operating system. We'll also look at how containers are different from virtual machines and where they share similarities. In later parts, we'll dig into networking, path mappings, variables, and passing through devices like GPUs, all the things you'll need to understand when working with containers on Unraid. Right, so let's get started on understanding exactly what a Docker container is. To do that, we need to start with something we're all familiar with, installing a program or application directly onto our computer. Whether it's a Windows PC, a Mac, or even directly onto Unraid as a plugin, the principle is the same. When you install a program this way, it gets built right into the operating system. Sometimes that's fine, but often the program doesn't come alone. It needs basically extra pieces, which are called dependencies. For example, if you've ever installed something on Windows and it's popped up a message saying you first need to install .NET or maybe Visual C++ Runtime, you'll know exactly what I mean. Those dependencies also get installed into the operating system alongside your program. And here's the problem. Once they're part of the OS, they're shared by all the software running on your computer. That means if two programs rely on the same dependencies, but maybe a slightly different version of it, you can end up with conflicts. One works and the other breaks. And sometimes you can even have the whole operating system start to behave unpredictably. That's one of the downsides of installing directly onto the operating system. But of course there are advantages too. The app can use whatever resources it needs. It isn't limited in any way, like for instance what a VM would be. If your machine has 32 gigs of RAM, the program doesn't have to reserve a chunk in advance. It just uses what it needs when it needs it. And because it's running right on the OS as well, it has access to all of the hardware, such as the CPU, GPU, memory, and the storage without any extra layers in between. That's the traditional way of doing things, going right back to the early days of computing, when programs were always installed directly into the operating system. But over time, another approach became widely used, and that's virtual machines or VMs. Now, VMs weren't originally created to fix software dependency problems. They were first developed in the 1960s and 70s as a way to share large, expensive mainframe computers so multiple workloads could be run at the same time. But the idea was quickly adopted more broadly because virtual machines also let you isolate applications. That meant they could solve many issues like we we're just talking about, dependency conflicts or one program breaking another when installed directly onto the server. So a virtual machine is basically a computer inside another computer. It doesn't just run the program, it runs an entire operating system, but that operating system is isolated from the host running the virtual machine. That means that anything installed inside the VM lives inside a completely separate system from the main computer running it. The software that makes this possible is called a hypervisor. That's the layer that sits on top of the operating system and carves up the hardware into separate VMs. You don't need to worry about the technical details, but the key thing is here, the hypervisor is what creates what's called the virtualization layer. So of course, this was a powerful way to get around the dependency problems we were talking about. For example, if you had one application that needed an old version of Java and another that needed a newer version, you could run each in its own VM without causing any conflicts. 
or in web hosting, one customer might need PHP, say, 5.6, while another needs PHP 7.2. And instead of fighting over which version to install on the host, each customer could get their own VM with the exact environment that they needed. Data centers took this even further. Instead of one big server running everything directly, they carved up the hardware into many smaller virtual machines. That's how VPS hosting was born, giving each customer their own isolated VM with their own operating system, apps, and no risk of stepping on each other's toes. But the trade-off is VMs are heavy. And what I mean by heavy is they carry the entire operating system with you, so you have to reserve CPU cores and memory just to keep them running, even if the applications inside the VM aren't using all of those resources. For example, if you assign 8 gigs of RAM to a VM, that memory is dedicated to it whether the app inside only needs 2 gigs or not. That's very different from running an app directly on your computer where it simply uses what it needs and gives the rest back to the system. So yes, VMs solved a lot of the dependency and isolation issues, but they did come at the cost of efficiency, which leads us to the next step, which is containers. So a container gives you much of the same isolation as a virtual machine, but without dragging along that whole extra operating system. To understand how that works, let's quickly break down two important parts of any operating system the kernel and the user space. Now, you've probably heard the word kernel lots of times before, but maybe never really understood exactly what it is. Now, don't worry, you're not alone. It's one of those terms that gets thrown around a lot in the Linux world, and many people just nod along without really knowing. Remember at the start of this video when I said you've probably seen the word Docker everywhere since you started using Unraid? Well, kernel's a bit like that too. It pops up all of the time, but nobody really stops to explain it. And here's the thing, every operating system has a kernel. It's not just Linux. Windows has a kernel, Mac OS has a kernel, but you just don't hear the word as often outside the Linux world. The kernel is simply the core of the operating system. And just to be clear, when I say kernel, I don't mean Colonel Sanders from KFC. This kernel doesn't fry chicken, it just talks to your hardware. So it's the part of the operating system that connects directly into the hardware, the CPU, the memory, the disk, the network card, and it decides how these programs get to use the resources. Think of it a bit like, I don't know, an air traffic controller. The software asks for resources and the kernel decides how and when to hand them out. Everything else that makes up the operating system is something called user space. That's the shell, the commands, the libraries, the packet manager, all of the tools and interfaces that make an operating system, well, feel like that operating system. It's whatever makes Windows feel like Windows, Mac OS feel like Mac OS, Unraid feel like Unraid, and Ubuntu feel like Ubuntu. Now, I just want to pause for a second, because this is where things get important, I think, when we talk about Docker. Now, strictly speaking, applications do run inside the user space. But when we talk about containers, I think it's useful to think of an application as sitting on top of its own user space. That's because a Docker container doesn't just package the app itself, it also bundles the exact user space tools and libraries that that app expects to have. So remember though, technically user space contains everything else that isn't the kernel. So it has all of the libraries, the dependencies and the applications. But for simplicity, I'm going to show the applications here sitting on top of user space. Anyway, going back to what we're talking about, the key difference between a virtual machine and a container is a virtual machine has both its own kernel and its own user space. That's why it's heavy. But a container, it only brings its own user space. The kernel always comes from the host. And instead of a hypervisor, containers are managed by the Docker engine. You can think of it as the equivalent as a hypervisor for VMs, but it's much lighter. The Docker engine is what starts and stops containers, isolates them from each other, and makes sure they share the host kernel safely. And here's the really cool part, I think. Because the Linux kernel is common across all Linux distributions, we can run a Ubuntu container, an Alpine container, a Debian container. All of these will run on our host, which in our case is Unraid, and they'll all just work. They're all just using the same host kernel underneath. Think of a container almost like a stripped-down virtual machine. 
It feels like its own little computer because it has its own file system and its own networking, but it doesn't carry the whole kernel or the full operating system with it. So if you run, say, a Ubuntu-based container on Unraid, it isn't using Ubuntu's kernel. It's just using Ubuntu's user space, its tools, its library, its packet manager, etc. Underneath, it's always talking to the same Linux kernel on the host, so the one Unraid is actually using. That's what makes containers so lightweight. You don't need to boot up an entire OS with a dedicated kernel. The container just drops its user space on top of the host kernel and starts running. And it's even lighter than that sounds, because a container doesn't bring along all of the user space tools that a full operating system normally has. It only includes the bare minimum libraries and tools that the application needs. That's why a container image can be so surprisingly small. Sometimes they're just a few megabytes compared to a VM, which would be a few gigabytes for the VM to be able to run. But even though containers are lightweight, don't think of them as just little programs running on your server. From inside the container, the world there looks completely different because it has its own file system, its own networking stack and its own environment almost like a tiny computer all on its own. Like I keep saying, the only thing it doesn't carry is its own kernel. So basically, a container gives you the isolation of a VM, but without the overhead of running that whole second operating system. So it's lighter, faster, and much easier to manage. And in the next part of this series, we'll look at how Unraid actually manages the containers, where the data goes, what's persistent, what isn't, and how the paths and mappings work in practice. That's where you'll see how this tiny computer connects back to your Unraid server. OK, so that brings us really to the end of part one. But I think before we wrap up, a quick note on naming. Now, you often hear people say things like, I've got a few Dockers running on my server. Now, I don't know if I should say this, but honestly, that phrase makes me wince a little bit every time I hear it. They're not actually Dockers, they're containers. Docker is the engine that runs them. So technically, what you're running are Docker containers. And just so you know, Docker isn't the only container runtime out there, but it's the one we use with Unraid. So if you want to sound accurate, just call them containers, don't call them Dockers. Anyway, so that brings me to the end of the video. Hopefully I'll catch you in the next part, guys. But until then, I'll see you later.